Hello, welcome to another session of Watercolors with Caroline. This is the first lesson and we're going to do some snowy sheep. You can choose whether you do the big fluffy woolly sheep in the snow or a herd of black faced, uh, I think they're called Highland horned sheep in the snow. Same colors for both of them, same method. You can do both if you want to. Uh, but I made mine into Christmas cards and that was the whole purpose of this lesson. So you can if you want or um, you can just use them as a painting. So let's get our paints out and uh, let's get started. So welcome. I know there's some new people joining us. So what I want to do is just go over a few of the basics before we start just this first time uh, so that you know what to do before the lesson starts. And especially if you're Zooming, you can be prepared for when we get together. So every week, about a week ahead of class, I send you the notes for the class with some color pictures, some instructions, and I make sure that I size the drawing to the size of the paper that we'll be using. So for this one, we're using four and a half by six inch paper. So that's the size of my line drawing. And if you have a light board, you can put your watercolor paper right over that and trace through. And if you don't have a light board, you can tape your, your drawing and your paper to a nice bright window and you can trace through that way and then have your paper all ready. So I'm gonna turn off my light board and I have to have the room light down when I have the light board on because it's um, helpful if the room is, is not as bright. Now, I also want to go over how to tape this down to the board because it's really important when you're finished and you're mounting your painting on card, it's so lovely to have a very crisp, clean and straight white border. And make sure if you put it, if you tape it down, your tape goes right across everywhere and you, and you burnish, this is called burnishing if you really push it down so it's nice and firm. I use, um, I use old election boards that people donate to me. They're called Coroplast. They're really um, inexpensive. And I make sure that I get my quarter inch or half inch, whatever I want, um, tape line by using quilting ruler. And I just make a little, little tiny mark on the quarter inch at each end. I don't want to see these marks and I want to be able to erase them easily when I'm finished so that they don't show. They're just a little guideline so I can get my tape straight. So let's put those on. And if I'm doing something for a customer or I'm going to sell my painting, I make sure I use the expensive artist tape and everything. But when I'm doing all of these demos, as I'm, I do loads of them, or just a Christmas card, I use this tape from the dollar store and it's to save money. So I'm going to get a piece that's quite long enough to go all the way along and I'm going to stretch it out and put it on those two little marks that I made and then burnish it down so I don't have any paint leaking under it. Now just ignore those people on Facebook and everywhere that say you have to put this tape on your clothing to get less tack. Don't do that. You get all little fibers from your clothing on the tape and you need it to stick firmly with no fibers and or anything. Otherwise the, the um, paint and water will wick under your tape and you'll get nasty, nasty uh, marks along the edge. This way you get a nice clean edge. Uh, make sure your tape crosses over. Don't do this. Don't get a piece of tape that's too small and put it here and then get another piece of tape to fill in. That's, that's not going to be, you're going to probably get leaking under that tape. I'm not saying don't do it, but don't, try not to do it. I see it a lot, people putting lots of little bits of tape and you end up with leaking under your border. Make sure it's firmly pushed down and then you're ready to start. So I'm going to start with the big sheep today. We're going to, I'm going to do both and you can, if you're watching the video, you can just watch and then pause the video and 
try it for yourself. I'm just going to zoom in for you there. So what we want to do is we want to wet the whole background for this first layer. Only the first layer gets wet. The rest you leave. And I'm going to use my number 10 brush for this. Just use a fairly big brush so you can get the water down quickly. You don't want to um, spend a lot of time fiddling with a little brush trying to get your paper wet because it'll dry before you're, you're done. If you use a brush that's too big on a little piece like this, it'll be too sopping wet and you'll have water dripping everywhere and it, it will be a mess. You just have to get, and I tip it, I tip it to see if it's all covered. You can see the shine from the water. And then I got a little Kleenex or kitchen towel and I need to get the water off of the tape edge or it's going to run right back into the, the paint which won't be a good thing. So I'm just going to clean up the tape edge. The other thing, I'm using 100% cotton paper, Ash, 140 pound. And you need to make sure that the water soaks in. The, the paper needs to absorb the water rather than it just sitting on the top. Because if the water is just sitting on the top, then your paint will just float on the top and it will sort of all float <clears throat> float away. It won't, it won't it won't do anything useful. Now, while that's soaking in, I'm going to get some paint. I want some ultramarine blue. Ultramarine blue is going to be one of the main colors we use. It's a good color for snow. And then I'm going to get a gray. I'm going to just zoom out a minute while I'm mixing paint. There we go. I'm going to mix a gray with the ultramarine blue and some burnt sienna. You see, I've got some previous mix here. That's okay. I'm going to mix right on top of it. I know what was there. So if I mix ultramarine blue and burnt sienna, I can get either a, a brown or a gray. And I've got something sort of a brownie gray there. That's good. And I'm also going to have a little bit of Payne's gray here, just if I want a, a nice cool gray. If you're good at mixing, then ultramarine blue plus burnt sienna makes makes a Payne's Grey. That's pretty much what it is. But sometimes it's nicer just to have a quick one to grab and it will, I've got lots of blobs of paint there. I don't usually have my mixing tray over the top of my paper but of course because I'm doing this under a camera I'm sort of keeping it all in one space. I will also need some salt handy, just ordinary, very ordinary table salt works best for this. We're going to make some sort of snow now I'm going to zoom in and then zoom back out again because I want to show you that when I put the paint on I'm going to be about a half an inch from the edge of the sheet because as I paint this paint's going to creep down towards the edge of the sheep and if I go too close it will creep into the sheep and the sheep will all be dark it won't be nice white wool. So I've got I'm going to put some ultramarine blue and you can see it creeping down already. I'm going to go into that gray that I mix. Let's bring it over a little bit. You can kind of see. I want some blue and some gray in the background. And I don't want to get too close to the sheep like I said. I'm going to go some Payne's gray over here. That maybe got a bit close but I'll show you how I can fix that in a minute. washing my brush and I'm just I've got a little little spongy thing here that I dab it on so it's not too wet. I can zoom out again so you can see the bottom. My camera doesn't like zooming sometimes when I'm filming. And along the bottom here um, I want to make sure that there's a snow bank there and then I'm going to have some snow down here. Just This is ultramarine blue just some little touches and again behind the sheep, a little bit of the grey. I like to get something in the corners quite often so that you can actually see the edge of the tape when I take it off. And over here where it's getting a little bit close to the sheep, I'm going to use my Kleenex. A nice soft Kleenex is best. And I'm just going to dab there and get that paint to go back away from the sheep. As the paper dries it 
is going to be easier and easier to get closer to the sheep. So it's starting to dry a little bit and I can go up a little closer here. Again, being careful not to go too much into the white because I want that to stand out. Now there's a point where the paint is starting to dry but not completely dry. That's the best time to put the salt on. And you have to watch very, very carefully because it's a time when the shine just starts to go from the paint and it becomes a sort of a satin color, um, a satiny, not so much a shine, but just a, it's hard to just say what it is, but it's not dry. When it's dry, it goes matte. And when it's wet, it's very shiny. So you want a sheen, a sort of a satin sheen. I'm just making sure I, I keep the, the dark back from the white wall of the sheep there. And on this corner here, difficult to see on the camera, but just on this corner, it's starting to dry to that sheen that I want rather than a shine. So I have to be very cognizant that I've got to do something before it's too dry. So I take a little bit of salt in my left hand and a, a little pinch like I'm going to season a stew and I, I'm going to sprinkle in this corner first because that's the one that's drying the quickest there. Down here where I at the bottom where I've just put paint on it's still quite wet so I want to <clears throat> want to avoid that area for now. I'm going to just put a little bit more a little bit more blue on just just because it's drying up and I can control it a little bit more. Again, using my Kleenex to help me. Up here, starting to dry now. So I'm going to sprinkle, and don't sprinkle on too much because you will take off all of the paint if you sprinkle too much salt. It takes a few minutes to work to make the little snowflakes. And down here it's a little bit early to put salt on but I'll have less of a snowflake look and more of a sort of a frosty look so it'll be okay put that on there and there we go now I'm gonna to have to leave this one for a little while and let it do its thing and I'll show you how to do the other one with the sheep in the field. Pretty much the same technique. But, um... So now we have the sheep in the field and we're going to do pretty much the same thing that we just did but with just a little bit more care where we put the color and I'm going to again wet the whole background. We're going to use the same colors. We're going to use the ultramarine blue, the mix of ultramarine blue and burnt sienna and maybe a little Payne's Grey. If you don't have Payne's Grey, it doesn't matter. Just use the ultramarine blue mixed with the burnt sienna. If you don't have ultramarine blue, cobalt blue will do. Ultramarine blue is just a little bit stronger. You can mix stronger colors. Again, I want to get the, the water off the tape edge. And ideally, I don't really want to have a minute of dead time where I'm doing nothing, but ideally, if you're doing this yourself, just wait. A minute before you put the color on. Now what I want, I want the most of the color, let's just look at this one, I want most of the color in the sky. In the original photo there was, um, let me grab the original photo, the original photo there were banks of trees and bushes and grass and in the first one I did I put all of that detail in and then I wasn't too I wasn't too keen on it with that much detail. I wanted to simplify it a bit. So this was the second one that I tried simplifying all the detail. I still put a little bit of um, sort of tree trunks and things in there. Maybe something that looks like bushes, but I prefer it with less rather than more. Again, I'm going to start with the ultramarine blue, and uh, I'm going to put a little bit of um, sky in. And I'm going to go straight into my grey mix, which is my burnt sienna and ultramarine blue, and put a bit more sky. Now it looks kind of strong, but once the salt has taken it down and the water interacts with it, 
it will um, be much lighter. Now over here, there's um, like bushes. I'm just going to put a bit of dark grey in here. And also over here, there's the, those trees. And put those in. I'm going to leave a little bit of white so that it's sort of like uh, mist and clouds in the sky. Add a little bit of blue in here. It's going to turn out ev different every single time I do it. And that's quite absolutely fine. I don't want to go near the sheep at this stage because I want them to stay nice and white. But I can, I can sort of go underneath them a little bit like this with some shadow in the snow. Take a little bit of the grey mix, put it in the corner here where I, may, I might do some of those brambles or I may not. May decide on this one just to put Merry Christmas there. And then I have to wait. See, it's quite wet. I have to wait for that moment when I can put the salt on. And watching it very, very carefully. Just up in this corner here, it is just starting to dry a little bit to how I need it for the, the salt. And what I see, I want my salt to make. I'm just what I'm doing is I'm just sucking up a little bit of that there. I want more of a snowbank rather than what's happening there. And this is a thirsty brush, that means wash my brush, take a little bit of moisture off of the brush, and use it to just suck up a little bit of that paint and moisture there to control it. And put a little bit, and the more the paper dries the better you can control everything. So I've got just the tip of my brush here. I'm actually going to get a little bit of uh, more sort of burnt sienna paint. These two little sheep here in the draw, in the uh, photograph, beg your pardon, they are behind some bushes. So I'm just kind of putting those in. I'm going to get a bit more burnt sienna. And there were some bushes here. Now, not much water in my burnt sienna. I'm going to put some in here. Maybe some in the trees here. If you add paint to wet paint or to wet paper, you have to use much less water with the paint. Now across the top here is getting just ready for the salt. So again, a little bit in my left hand. Take a pinch and just gently, I'm, the top is drying first. So I'm just gently going to sprinkle a little bit there and tip it to see. I can put a little bit more over here and the salt is going to lighten a lot of that paint that I put on. A little bit early to do down here. It's, um, it's so hard when I know that you're just watching paint dry and I'm cognizant of filming time, class time. It's so hard to be patient and wait because I think, oh, you're just going to watch me waiting. That's not very exciting. These corners are just sort of drying up. I'm just going to, I'm going to go ahead. Now, sometimes you have to do part of the painting and wait for the rest of the painting to be ready. You can't. And what I see some people do is they spend a long time wetting their paper and probably not wet enough. And then they spend a long time painting. And by the time they've finished doing all of that, everything is, is dry. And then they put their salt on. And of course, it all sits on top of the dry paint doing absolutely nothing. So you have to be quite quick wetting and quite quick painting. And then you have to stop painting and do the salt in sections sometimes so that you get everything just right. Now, it's very tempting to put too much on because you can't see what it's doing. But I think that's enough. And I'll go back to the second one that I did here. And that's very salty, but I like that kind of cloudy, cloudy look that happens. And then this one here that I did in class, really salty. It gave a kind of a windswept sky. So they all come out differently. And I just love how they, they do that. It's uh, interesting that you never get to the same. You always get a different result. And it's entirely dependent on how dry the paint and paper is when you put the salt on and you have to look for that sheen just as the paint loses its 
full shine of wetness. And you can see on this one, you can see the snowflakes forming up the top here. Down the bottom where I, it's a bit more wet, you're going to see more of a sort of a snowdrift look. And that's good too. I get two different looks on the painting. Now later you'll see that I will fill in some of the shadow behind the sheep and I'm just looking to see how wet the paper is. As the paper dries, you can do more and more without worrying about the paint bleeding around. So if I want to get a little bit more shadow around these sheep, now that the paper's starting to dry a little bit, I can start putting that in. I can't put it in when the paper's really wet. And you can't put salt in after your paper's dried. You can't do it on the second go. It's a very much a first. As soon as you get the paint on, your salt has to go on. And then I'm just going to put a little bit more blue. I can see that the paper's just wet enough to take a little bit of that ultramarine blue paint so that the sheep stand out a little bit more as white. And because the paper's not very wet, it will stay exactly where I put it. All of watercolor is about gauging how much water to use with your paint, how wet to make your paper, and watching very precisely for when that paper is dry enough to work on. And also, I'm, my brush doesn't have any water on it. My paint has very little water with it now. So that's controlling it too. That's making sure that it doesn't go anywhere that I don't want it to. I, I want to, what I want is, I want the white sheep to stand out. And I can do that by putting a little bit of dark behind them. And these ones that are in the bushes here, I still have time, it's still wet enough. I can put a little bit of extra there, but not too much. I don't want to paint into the salt too much because that's going to give me um, some very odd effects if I actually put paint into the salt. But you can see here the ultramarine blue and the burnt sienna are separating, which is going to give a lovely, lovely look to the, um, to the bushes that the sheeps are standing in. And that's two lovely things that ultramarine blue and burnt sienna they, they do what's called granulate, which means that they will separate out in the water into their um, two sort of colors with all the variant colors in between. So it's, it gives an unpredictable but rather lovely look. So now I've just put a little bit more of that ultramarine blue and burnt sienna mix there. And now I've got to stop. It's drying too much to do anymore. And you can really see how the salt is forming the snowflakes here, which is so different to this kind of snowdrift where it was a little bit wetter. So that's the first stage. And don't dry with a hairdryer until everything has has worked, until your salt has made all of your snowflakes, until the shine and the sheen has completely gone off of your paper and it's starting to look kind of dry. You can't put any more paint on at that point. And also, you shouldn't have much salt left when that's happened. When this has all done its thing, there should be just a few grains of salt left. And I will use, I've got a big, a big soft brush. When this is all dry, I'm going to use a big soft brush to brush all the salt off of everything so it doesn't get in my paint or ruin the next layer. But this needs to be dry first. Now that's stage one. And then we'll go on and do stage two, which is adding all your detail. Well, and you don't see something happening straight away. As you can see with mine under the camera, it's happening kind of slowly. Uh, the salt crystals, they have to absorb the water around them and then they push, they push the pigment away as they absorb that water and make those little snowflakes. And really it doesn't matter what effect you get as long as you just give it a go. We're gonna we're gonna do some other stuff. So it'll be fine. All right. So how's everybody doing? What I'm gonna do, tell you what I'm gonna do, everybody. I'm going to mute myself for a minute. And now that this has um, started to really make snow, I'm gonna use my hair dryer and I'm gonna get them nice and dry. 
so that um, so that I can work on the next st stage while you're just sitting watching and um, waiting for yours to dry. So I'm going to be mute for a second. And if you do this right, if you've done it just at the proper time, there's very little residue left. Like I have a few, just a few stray grains of salt left. And I just want to get them off of there because if they get in the next layer of paint, they really affect how the paint lays on the paper. They inhibit it and it's, it's really tough. So I want to get, and I'm using a big soft brush to do that so that I don't put any oil from my fingers on the paper or smudge any paint. I'm great for smudging paint everywhere. And I've just brushed both of those off. And, um, and they always look a bit odd after the first layer, but we're gonna do so much to the sheep and everything else that whatever you've got is gonna work. You don't have to worry about it. Now let's um, find, uh, in here. So let's find the, this one. So the, the second thing we're going to do on this painting on the big sheet is put yeah. some uh, woolly texture on with some raw sienna and some burnt sienna and give a little bit of uh, texture to his wool. And we're going to have a very light touch with that. It doesn't matter if you go too light at first. You can put a second layer that's a little bit darker if you feel that way. What I what happened to mine, and, and I think it's what often happens, is I went quite light to start with, and then I painted in the brown face and brown ears and everything. And then this all looked too light. Once I'd got the dark in, it looked too light. But that's okay. I just went over it with another layer, a little bit more dark when the brown was all dry. And you have to make those judgments sort of before and after putting other colors on because it does affect everything so much. Let's put that big brush away. So I'm gonna work on the big woolly sheep first and put his his shadow or her, it's a, definitely a her, her shadows on. And I want a slightly smaller brush for that. So I'm picking up my number six brush or one that's sort of about this size. And now I want a couple of puddles of paint I want I bought a nice stand for my brushes and I got to use it. So I want some raw sienna. If you don't have raw sienna, yellow ochre is fine. They're very, very similar colors. And each paint manufacturer makes them differently. And I've just found that this one is more transparent than, than yellow ochre and I like it more. And then I would like a mix of those. So some raw sienna with some burnt sienna. And make sure that I mix them with water because I don't want them to be too, too dark. If they're too dark, the sheep's not going to look like it has sort of off-white wool. Let's zoom in a little bit. And you'll notice here, like my, my blue has gone over the edge of the sheep here. And it's kind of formed a woolly surface. And I can do a number of things to fix that. I could use, I have a little um, quite stiff brush. I can use quite a stiff brush and some water and I could and blot with a Kleenex and I can mm -hmm. just I can just blot that color out. Now this little brush is designed for doing that. I've got one called an eradicator and this is another one that's designed for doing this. You can also use a little brush that's designed for acrylics or a little brush that's designed for oils. They're just a little bit harder than a watercolor brush. And they're lovely for just taking out color that you don't want. Now the colors we've used don't stain. Uh, ultramarine blue doesn't stain, burnt sienna doesn't stain, Payne's gray, they don't stain. So it's much easier to wash them off if you don't want them. And see, I've got rid of that. Now, if that didn't work, my next choice of fixing is the Dr. P.H. Martin's white, but you don't have to have, you can have white gouache. Uh, white acrylic's usually too shiny, but I'll tell you what's, what's just come on the market. This is Golden's uh, acrylic paint, completely flat. 
completely flat. There is no shine, no sheen or anything to this acrylic paint. These were samples that they sent to iron oxide. And they're rather nice because I, I've got the black and white here on my table because you can use them as accents on a watercolor, final accents, and they will be as flat as the watercolor. They won't kind of stand out as shiny. So that's a new product from Golden. And I'm just mixing a little, uh, not too much there, a little bit of Dr. PH Martin's white with some water. And if I wanted to, if I wanted to get back the white of the coat, I could always use that as well. It's gonna make it a bit too white, but I'm only demonstrating that technique for you. And I would probably do that right at the end. I just want you to see what you can do if you lose a little bit of the white, you don't have to worry about it. And places like this, I just kind of want that shadow on the wall. That's okay, put that away for now. We're gonna use that to spatter snow later. Wash my brush out. Right, so I've got I've got my mix ready to put some shadow on the sheep. I, grab, I want to grab my actual photo that I have printed out because I like to follow the shadows that I see. And if you look at the the little fuzzy bit on top of the head here, you can see some shadow along here. Quite a bit of shadow on the chest. And you want to try and keep these outer edges really nice and light. So I'm going to start with that little top knot up here and the tip of my brush. And this is the raw sienna, or you can use yellow ochre. And I just want to put some shadow where it's going to touch the, the very dark part of the skin. And right up the center of this little part here, it's kind of, in shadow here so I'm what I'm doing is little um little horizontal strokes because if you look at this sort of center parting up here that's how it looks kind of like little horizontal strokes I'm putting those up here and that's my first and they will look they will look very dark because everything else is white it's surprising once you get the dark brown and everything else on they will look really light so don't worry too much now, the other place that it's quite dark is along the edge of the face here. So I'm going to put the shadow in there. And as I come out away from the face, I want to make sure I have that bubbly, bubbly texture of the sheep. And I'm going to use the tip of my brush to manipulate the paint so it, it has that bubbly texture. The other place there is shadow is on this side of the face. I want to put that in too. And all the time I'm doing the fur, not the fur, the wool, I guess you call it on a sheet. I'm using the very tip of my brush and making that, that bubbly look with it. Sometimes if, if that gets a little bit too repetitive, I've got a completely wet, no paint brush now. And sometimes I just like to smooth it out a little bit with a wet brush. So it's not too repetitive. Do you know what I mean? If you have too many like bubbly lines, it's too much. Some gives you that idea that you've got texture. Now it's quite dark under the chin, but I will do the darker layer when the first layer is dry. You can't do it all at once. Well, you could, but it's it's a little more challenging. So let's not. I want to have this area under the chin and the chest a little bit darker. And I'm not painting in everything you notice. I'm leaving some white space. Even if there's not as much white space on the photograph. Down here, there's a... a shadow and now I'm going to switch to the burnt sienna and raw sienna mix because it gets much darker down here towards the legs and it, it will have another layer later there will be more but I want to get that into
wash. Sometimes I wash my brush and just have a wet brush that's clean to kind of ease those brush strokes in a little bit so they're not too sharp. I want all of this wall to look soft. Now over on over on this side, it's more of a cool blue sort of shadow. So I can go back to my ultramarine and pick a little bit of that ultramarine up. And I'm just going to mix it in with a little bit of that raw sienna to make a sort of a soft blue gray, a lot of water. And then I'm going to just put a little bit of blue gray shadow. Now that's too harsh, but I'm not worried. Take my wet, clean brush and just smush that in a little bit so it's not quite so harsh. See, I'm, I'm pushing, it's, um, instead of using the tip of my brush, I'm sort of pushing it down a bit and it's got nothing on, no paint, just water. Take a little bit more of that soft gray and I'm just going to do a little bit of that soft gray over here and a little bit coming down here. Now, like I said, we're going to have a lot more shadow later, but this is your first, your first pass. A little bit here. Now, if you if you want to show a white edge, it helps to have something dark behind it. And you can have lost and found edges, like this edge here where we have all the snow behind it, that's a found edge. This edge can get completely lost if you like. I could take an eraser and take out my pencil lines and just completely lose some of those edges. And that's kind of a really nice thing that you can do in painting. The other thing you can do is if you want to put a little bit more color behind the sheep at any time, you can wet just behind the wool area, take a little bit of blue or gray, and just put a little bit more shadow in if you want to, so that that edge pops out a little bit. So it, it becomes lost and then found again. If you keep the wool edge dry and this edge wet, you're going to control your paint. It won't go where you don't want it to go. So I've just put a little bit more, I have a little bit more, it's just color up here, just with the tip of my brush, just sort of like, you know, muddy piles. And I might do a little bit of that over here too. So same thing. I'm going to just wet this area just here up to the edge of the sheep. And then I'm going to just put a little bit of that blue, the ultramarine blue with a touch of burnt sienna to make it a little bit gray. Put that in there. And I might do a little bit, a little bit back here, muddy puddles in the, in the snowy field. I feel it's too linear. Get my wet brush, smush it in a little bit. And what I know I need a, some of too is some shadows under the sheep. Like these, these piles of snow that the sheep's standing in, they need some shadows too. I'm putting those on dry paper over the top of everything I've got here. Again, I'm going to clean my brush. Dab it on my sponge. I'm sure my sponge here so you can see what I'm doing. And I want to just ease those lines in to make them soft with my wet brush. And take a little bit of gray, Payne's gray. And again, ease a little bit more shadow here. A little bit more. There. And that's kind of done a little bit more to the background and you have more control working on the dry paper. You want it nice and wet to have all the snow happening and then you can add a little bit more with more control when the paper is dry. So you can work in layers. You don't have to do it all on the first pass if it doesn't 
if it's too much to control. Same with um, same with this one. We've got all of the snow happening, but you might want to have a little bit more um, happening in the background, or you might want to have a little bit more dark behind the sheep so that they stand out white, but that's hard to control in the first layer. So we can do it in the second layer. You can get, I, I like to use the ultramarine blue mostly for the snow shadows, but I like to dull it down a little bit with the burnt sienna, not a lot, just a little bit so it's not quite so bright in your face blue. And now this paper's dry, so I can start to sort of ease. My, it's a slightly smaller brush, and I'm going to use my number six to ease the paint in with a wet brush. So I've got one in one in each hand here. And I want to get a little bit of shadow behind the sheep so that they look white. I'm taking that that gray blue, putting it behind the sheep little bit at a time and I've got my wet brush my wet number six and before before that dries I can't let it dry before it dries I have to move that paint around and make it into background shadow on the snow before it can dry okay two A little bit of paint, smush it in a little bit. Now, it's impossible to get these sheep like this when the paper's wet because they would just get lost. You can do masking fluid or you can do white paint afterwards, but both of those give them a very, very hard cutout look edge. This is going to give them a much softer softer look if you do this little bit of paint little bit of water it won't be so so cut out and pasted on i'm going to slightly bluer bluer mix over here when i first put it on it's going to look very hard and dark the key is to get that wet brush in quite quickly and blend it in before you do too much. You can't go on and do like the next two, three sheep. You've got to, got to get in there kind of quick. I'm going to put a little bit, I'm going to get some burnt sienna. There's a, quite a few bushes behind these sheep and I'm going to put a little bit of burnt sienna in here to indicate that there's, there's bushes and bracken and that kind of thing into the wet paint. Give it a little bit of detail there. And under the sheet, there's going to be shadows under them too. We can put a few of those in a little bit darker and wet my brush. Drag it around a bit, get those shadows in. Now I'm going to go into the Payne's Gray, mostly the Payne's Gray. And if you want here, there's trees on the hill. If you want to do this, if you feel like you want a bit more of something happening here, again, I'm putting the Payne's Gray on in no kind of shape to start with. I just want to get that dry edge to the hill to start with. Then wet brush. And I'm going to pull that paint upwards. If you feel this is too scary, you don't need to do this part. You can just leave your snowy background. I'm just going to pull that up. Now, on this one, I have some sort of trees showing, but I haven't done that in this layer. That's done after this layer is dry. This is my sort of um, prep for putting those on later. A few sort of raggedy tops they're going to be trees and that's going to all dry just a little bit lighter than I've put on there 
So now this one needs to dry before I do any more to these sheep. This one needs to dry a little bit before I do any more to the sheep and I'll probably use my hairdryer. So I'm going to mute and use my hairdryer for a bit just to make sure I can work on the next layer. You work at your own pace. I'll check in with you in a minute. Okay, so we've got the first layer on here. And what I want to do now is put the brown on the face so that um, I can gauge the and the legs. So then I can gauge how dark to go with the rest of the body. So let's see, we're going to mix a nice dark brown. I'm going to check my notes a minute. Oh, look, I've got salt all over my iPad. Let's move that out of the way. Okay, um, so for, let's see what I said. I said mix burnt sienna, sepia, and Payne's gray to make a dark brown. Those are good colors. And again, it doesn't matter what you use. You could use uh, burnt umber, you could use sepia, you can use a dark brown that you have in your paint box. If you mix ultramarine with any brown, it makes it darker. Uh, if you mix Payne's gray with brown, it makes it darker. You don't have to have the colors that I use. I don't think that you have to. Um, yeah, so what did I say? I said sepia, right, sepia, here we go. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so you can um, see what I'm doing. Sepia just happens to be one that I like. It's kind of a very uh, neutral sort of a brown. Um, it's very like uh, burnt umber but my burnt umbers always seem to really dry up. There's something about the pigment that really dries the paint up and I prefer that the sepia stays more moist. So I can add to that a little bit of um, Payne's Gray to take it down a little bit darker. See, it's already gone quite dark. And I want to add a little bit of um, burnt sienna because I want to use it for the face as well. And I'm gonna put burnt sienna on this side of my puddle so that I can get dark and medium browns from the same puddle and I can mix them about sort of like this puddle here where I mix the burnt sienna with the ultramarine blue I can get a variety of of grays and browns just by having uh, different areas to my puddle it's how I work and I will I'll start with the legs because the reason is but this leg here behind is kind of a little bit less distinct than the front three. So I want to do the front three and let them dry and then do the leg at the back. I need to be quite small in my brush. I'm going to my number four. I use bigger brushes for mixing because you can get a little bit more color down and you don't destroy your little brushes. And the legs are quite dark. So I want to go into that darker brown that I mixed and to get the legs to look round, zoom in again. First, I paint the whole leg just with, with the color, just one flat sort of color. And I've got to remember when I go up to the wool of the body, I'm going to make that bubbly shape. And when I come down to the snow, the legs are in a snow mound. So I have to make a snow mound shape. It's very helpful that they're in a snow mound because we don't have to have to paint any hooves or anything complicated. Now I've got that flat color on, but in the photograph, the left hand side of those legs was a little lighter. So it's, it's helpful to just lift off paint to get that 3D look. I've washed my brush, I've dried it on my sponge and I've dried it a little bit more on my Kleenex. And it's called a thirsty brush. And I'm just gonna lift up a little bit of that color on the left-hand side. Now the color from the right-hand side will sort of bleed into it and that will give it a soft round look. And if, it, if it's still not light enough, 
you can take it off when it's dry too. It's pretty subtle in the in the photo. It's not that much different. Just gives it a little bit of 3D look. So let's go to the second leg. And again, I want to make sure that um, I do that bubbly, bubbly um, wool as I come up to the the sheep and make sure I'm using the very tip of my brush, very point. And the, the back leg is right beside this one, but I want to, it to dry before I put the back leg in and I want it to be lighter or more blue. So I'm gonna do the thirsty brush thing again. I added a little bit more burnt sienna to the right side. And then with my thirsty brush, I'm just gonna pick up a little bit of paint from the left side. It's just subtle, it doesn't need to be much. If you do it too much, you'll get a great big stripe there. It just subtly makes it a little bit rounder. And then the one on the right over here. And then, and then when these are dry, I'll put the other one in. Now I want the face to be a bit more brown than the legs. So I'm going to add in a little bit of burnt sienna and I can go darker brown with the second layer. And I want to start with the ear over here on the left. And I've got a look. I'm going to have two layers on here. The first layer I want to be a, a more burnt sienna, richer brown. So I'm going to bring that round first. Remember the woolly, little woolly front piece on the face. Again, you're going to push, push the point of your brush up into that. Now, there, there is the left eye over here. I'm going to leave that for a minute because I want to get this sharp line going down the nose and if I leave that to dry before I put this piece in I will I will have a sharp line and I, what I'm going to try and do is leave a little white line where the nose is and if that doesn't work I can fill it in with a black line later I don't have to worry too much but I'm going to try and see what I mean I'm just going to leave a little dry space where the nose is and the edges of the lips are kind of white too. I think they may be, and not only white, they have a little bit of snow on them maybe. So I'm gonna try and leave the edges of the lips white as well. And this is where you get really delicate with your, with your brush. Small brush, use the pointed tip. And I've gone into the slightly darker brown for the underneath of the chin and I want to get my photo out so I'm looking at the photo. Uh, it's quite dark across the top of the head here, this bit. And again, you have to remember that you've got to kind of give that woolly look to the edge of the, the wool by wiggling your brush in there. And we're gonna go around the eyes for now fill them in after. And just around the ears, there's a little bit of snow and slightly lighter skin. So I'm just doing a little bit of water in there to lighten that up. I'm going to come down the, the side of the face. And again, make it kind of little bit woolly where the wool meets the face. I had a little bit of a um, dry line there, so I want to blend that in. And the other ear, I'm going with the, the warmer burnt sienna for the first layer. I'm gonna go back with a darker layer. The 
that in first. I'm washing my brush out. Got a little, little paint off there. And then I want this to dry before I do the left part of the face. And I want it to dry before I do the eyes. I don't think you've ever, I don't know if you've noticed. And if you've had sheep or looked after sheep, you probably will have. And you can barely see it on the sheep's eyes, but um, sheep and goats and quite a few other ungulates, they have eyes. Uh, they have a, a pupil that goes very horizontal like this, with like a bit in the middle like this. And that's very distinctive of a sheep and a goat and an, a little bit in horses too. So we can barely see it on the sheep, but it's something to keep in mind if you're painting it. So don't, you know, when you've got a sheep's eye, like don't paint it uh, round because even if you make that shape, it will look a little bit odd, even if it's that small. And if you find in this, this size of, painting too difficult to um, do with a paintbrush, you can use a pen right at the end. You know, you've got the eye. And if right at the end, you just want to use the pen to put that horizontal pupil in, there's nothing wrong with that. You can, you can do that. Got some pens close by. So that's kind of um, wet right now. So I want to leave that a little bit to dry. And while it's drying, I can use the same color mixes to work on these sheep in the field. So again, we're going to have the raw sienna and then the burnt sienna. And I might use a little bit of the dark brown mix too to make these sheep. And then the faces, the faces are quite dark. There are, there's Highland black faced sheep and the the males have those great big curly horns and the females have those little curled horns and most of these are I think this here this has got the big curly horns and that might be might be one of the males there but they're they're a specific black face horn sheep so the faces can be pretty dark and they tend to be that kind of a, a shape sort of like a triangle with a flattened off edge to the nose. And if you if you just do the shapes kind of correctly, the people looking at it, they'll fill in the rest and it'll read as sheep. You don't have to be super, super uh, picky about doing every little detail. So I, I always, what I do like to have always is, I like to have the photo so I can check that I'm doing things correctly in the correct places and the correct shapes. And like I said, because I get these photos from Facebook, it's the free reference photos for artists. They say you can use them to paint. Uh, they give me permission to use them in class, but you're not allowed to send the actual photo to people or, or uh, reproduce. I can reproduce the photo. You can, you can go onto the uh, Facebook site if you want, find the photo, but I'm not supposed to send it to you or reproduce it. And I shouldn't really have it in the video, but I'm kind of like flashing it over quickly. But we can definitely use the image to do the painting. So let's see, we're going to start with the, I'm going to go back to my number four brush and start with the raw sienna. And I need to mix up a little bit more because I've made mine all dark now. I might even need to go to my number two. I think I might, I might switch to my number two brush because these guys are pretty small. Grab my number two brush. And although it's better for me to start over on the left and move left to right so I don't smush it with my hands, I find on this one it's easier to start in the middle because this there's one white sheep in the middle here and it's kind of easier to start there. It's the biggest sheep. And for some reason, I do those little ones off to the left last. So I'm noticing that um, the hindquarters of the sheep here are a little bit darker. I'm using the raw sienna. I will darken up with a bit more dark paint later, but let's get the raw sienna on first. The back leg is a bit darker. And again, I'll put that on later. And the side of the sheep, 
is a raw sienna color. And then the front is a little bit more dark. So I'm just going to go to that brown that I mixed up. And I'm going to go a little bit darker down the front of the sheep. Now, something we're going to be doing a lot in this series of eight lessons is putting on paint and then blending it in with a wet brush. That's one technique I'm really focusing on. And it has to be always done while your paint is wet. And it's a great way to control your paint and your and your paint strokes. You put it on, make sure it's not too dry when you put it on, of course, and then control it with with a wet brush. Now right behind, right behind the foreleg of the sheep, quite dark. And I'm putting on the dark right now and here. I'm putting it on now because I want it to blend very softly into the paint that I already have on there. Coming down under this big woolly neck kind of dark and put that in. And this little, little brown insides to the ears. And I barely see the eyes. And I'll put the nose on later when that's all, all dry. They look weird. They will look weird until you're finished. And then when you put the finishing details in, it will all come together. So don't get distressed if they look a little weird at this point. They will. So this one here is it's actually quite dark. I want to leave the areas that are against the background lighter and some of the chest. So this is just, just like a first layer. And I'm gonna get a little bit of darker paint on my number two brush now. So a small brush, I can have a lot of control. And I'm using that darker paint here and here. And I can put some finishing touches of detail when this is when this is dry. I will need some extra details. And again, if, if your paint goes where you don't want it to, what you do is you wash your brush, dry your brush, and use that damp dry brush to just control your paint and we're sort of going in this order for all of them a bit of raw sienna and then a bit of dark brown and then when that's dry we'll put a bit more dark brown and the finishing details this one's quite raw sienna -y. I didn't do every sheet that was in the picture. I kind of left a couple out. And this one too. And they're all darker under the belly and under the neck. This is where I work on these ones. For some reason, I just don't like working on these indistinct ones before the closer ones. I think I need to really find my way with the closer ones first before I go into the ones that are less distinct. Just my brain wants that help. Oh, and again, the raw sienna, then the, then the darker brown. soft shadows and this this sheep in my original photo was hidden behind some bushes as I need to invent this one a little bit based on the others. Now the other thing that's in the photo, that you may or may not want to do is all of this 
sort of bracken and, and bushes in the front. And that's totally up to you. But what I always use for things like that is a, uh, a script liner brush. And this is a two over zero Princeton velvet touch script liner. I've tried a few different ones. This is my favorite. And I'm just going to use that dark brown that I made for the sheep's face. And I'm going to use this script liner to um, put in some branches. Now I've got to be careful that I don't touch the sheep with this because the sheep are wet, remember? And if I touch the sheep with this, then it will bleed into the sheep. Now I'm, I'm starting at the tape and then I'm kind of wiggling my brush and making a little bit of this, this bracken in the foreground. You don't have to do that. If you want to uh, write your greeting there, I've actually glued this. No, I didn't actually, I um, stenciled that. I have some glue on ones of these and I stenciled this one. You can put your greeting down there. You can leave it un unpainted. I might leave this one unpainted. It's up to you. Or if you like all these rambles in the front, then you can put those in there. Just kind of, again, you wiggle your brush, kind of follow um, what you can see on the picture if you have it. It's very confusing because there's a lot of branches here and you definitely don't have to do all of them. Most of them are sort of leaning towards the left or straight up. And it's something that if you like, if you like this kind of a look, you can always work on that slowly over a period of time after the rest is all finished. And I probably would, I'd probably spend a lot of time later just putting a bit more uh, bramble work in in the front if I wanted it. The other place there's quite a bit, I'm gonna get the ultramarine blue and burnt sienna mix now. There's quite a bit over here behind these sheep. And um, I'm gonna flick, and you have to do this fairly quickly, otherwise it doesn't work. I'm gonna flick this, this script liner, get a little bit of Payne's Gray. I'm gonna flick it around here under these sheep to kind of conceal them just like they are in the photo behind quite a bit of dead grass or something here. Another brush that you can do this with is um, one for this purpose, it's called a uh, grainer. Uh, it has a very wispy top to it. This is another Princeton. I like um, Princeton brushes. My favorites, of course, are my silver black velvet, but they don't make all kinds of these different ones. And I like that these different ones exist. So this gives you a very, um, I'm just, I've loaded mine with some paint. This gives you um, those kind of random, you know, grass strokes if you, if you pull it around, if you wanted a lot of sort of random grass and, and stuff, this is quite good for that here and maybe even over here. If you don't want to do tons and tons of individual ones with your script liner, this one is going to give you a, a few at a time with these fuzzy edges. I had one that was cheaper and it was way too um, uniform, like every, every space was uniform. It just gave too much of a uniform look. I like this one is more um, random. So you could put a bit in with that if you wanted. Just giving you ideas. You don't have to rush out and buy this brush if, if you think, well, I'm never going to do that again. That's that's the thing. Or if you can get, if you've got an old brush, you can actually snip bits out of it with your scissors, 
and make one of these yourself. No reason why not. Uh, I think it was only four or five dollars. It was not an it was not an expensive brush. This one's a quarter of an inch one. I just I just love trying new brushes, so I'm I'm terrible at just constantly buying them. Anyway, I guess I gave my sheep a little bit of time to dry while I was doing that. And I can go back to my little number two brush. And I'm going to do the black faces now. So I want to do a nice dark black face. So I'm going to use the sepia or any dark brown that you have. And I'm going to use Payne's Gray with it to get a really nice dark black face. Now, if you don't have Payne's Gray, you can use Ultramarine Blue, Burnt Sienna and Sepia, and you should get it almost uh, this dark. Let me show you how. Let me show you that's that's possible. So Ultramarine Blue. Burnt Sienna are coming in from the right here. A bit more Ultramarine Blue and some Sepia bit more ultramarine blue and it's almost as dark you wouldn't notice that in a small sheep you wouldn't notice which was which Payne's gray is just a little bit more easy to to grab if you want to dark or if you if you have a really dark dark brown or dark gray that's that's good right I'll go back to my tiny brush and the faces are just tiny and what I've tried to do when I did them was I've tried to paint it under the horns too they're kind of a triangle that's sort of cut off at the at the edge and with the very tip of this brush or with it I have an even tinier brush I have a a Princeton three over zero which is even smaller than a zero and I'm going to try that one to do the horns. Just to go around, just go around the edge of them. Like that. It's a little bit too small to do the whole face. Um, the other thing that sort of makes them look real is when you also put some black legs in. It just helps indicate that they are sheep. And... this one in everything looks odd close up and as you're doing it you'll be doubting yourself and like, that's never gonna look like sheep but you have to do all of them finish it walk away and then come back and look at it and I bet you you'll be very surprised that once you've done that they do look like sheep your eye has to see the whole thing for the first time to kind of figure it out. I'm using my little tiny brush here. The legs, the legs are quite small, quite dainty. You can't see a lot of them because they're in the snow. This little guy, you can't, female rather, you can't see much of her, the little nose. Kind of got her eyes closed. She doesn't have black legs or a black face. These ones do. Now this is, I know this is a slow, this is a bit of a slow process, and I I won't do all of it. I'll just like I did with the other class, I just kind of do a bit of it and then go back to the other sheep. And then the final step for the sheep is to put a bit more shadow on with a small brush. So I'm going back to my dark brown. And this one has a, quite a bit of dark brown at the back here and just in here and kind of behind the horn. So I've put that on, wet my brush and with my wet brush, I'm going to soften all of that in to give the, the sheep a little bit of shape, a little bit of shadow underneath. Again, if I feel that it's not sort of standing in the snow, 
I can do the same thing. I can put a little bit more shadow under the sheep to make it look like it's standing in the, in the snow and not just kind of floating on top of it. These ones too, kind of sort of just floating on top of the snow. So I have to add a little bit of shadow in there. Again, wash my brush, wet brush, blend it in a little bit. I'm going to do one more and then I'll go back to the big sheep. So this, um, this sheep here needs some, some dark behind the head, some dark here, wet brush and blend it in a little bit. And I can, that's about the state, whoops, there we go. It's about the stage I got to with this one. I hadn't filled in all the rest of the sheep yet. I'm putting the shadows in here and putting the faces in. And then I've got to do the rest of these. And then when, then when you look at the whole thing, and they're not very distinct, but when you look at it as a whole with everything, your brain or the person viewing, they know their sheep. They figure they're sheep. They don't fuss about whether or not they're sheep or not. They just know they are. And they don't look for the small, tiny details. So for the eyes, um, I want to use a, I'm going to use raw sienna with a little bit of burnt sienna um, for the main part of the eye. And put the pupil in later. And put that one in. And while that's just drying, I'm going to put a little bit more shadow on the sheep. Still very light compared to the photograph. If you look at the photograph, um, here under the chest is, is a bit darker. So I just want to put a little bit more dark on the chest. And take my number six brush. To, and I'm going to use the darker brown, but watered down. I'm watering it down so it's not quite as, as dark. And I'm going to put in some shadow under the chest here. And I'm going to use my wet brush to just squish it in. I just got to answer a message, one second. Right, and under the under the chin, there's also some uh, darker area under the chin. So again, same thing. Put it in and then smush it in. Put it in first. Get the shadow in. Wet brush. Dab it off a little bit, and then use that wet brush to control and soften your brush strokes. beside the face, I just want to go warmer brown. Anytime I want to go warmer brown, I use the burnt sienna. I want to have a little bit more warmth and depth just beside the, the face. I'm going to do those wiggly strokes. I know it looks really dark as you're looking at it, but it will smush in with my wet brush and it will dry a lot lighter. A little bit, a few more more little woolly woolly parts in especially here wet brush and just make sure I soften them all up and um, even on top of the head just looking at the photograph this little part here is just a little bit darker I'll put a little bit more in there And 
Now the um, the eyes are still a little bit wet. So I'll get a bit of really quick, really quick going over with the hairdryer so my eyes don't get all um, absorbed into the sheet. One second. There we go. All right, I want to do a slightly darker layer on the sheep's head. So I'm going to mix the um, burnt sienna with the, um, I, might, I might just change the mix up a little bit just so it's slightly different. I'm gonna mix it with the ultramarine blue just cause I, I don't like to use the same same colors all of the time I like to change it up we've only got a small range of colors here I'm only using um, a few colors so not like I'm changing it up a huge amount it's just giving a little bit of variety so the first thing I need to do is I need to get some a smaller brush shall I for the ears I want some definition to the edge of the ear it's, it's kind of dark along the top and here and it's it's kind of dark on the inside here and that's just here and it's a lot it's quite a lot darker on the top of the head so I want to darken that bit up a little bit and across the top of these ears anytime I have an edge I just want to use a wet brush to soften it up a little bit and top of the ear is a bit lighter, and then we're coming along the edge here. On the inside, I'm not going to do a huge amount of detail. I'm just going to give a little bit more structure so you can really see what's going on. Now, this side of the face is we left it, so we got had a hard edge as the nose went down. So I just want to put that side of the face in. A little bit of shadow there and it has kind of absorbed right into the eye I didn't get that very dry I don't think okay you know what I will take the eye out later and I've got one more leg to put in too so I'm going to mix a little bit of blue with that brown and put that back leg in it's a little bit more gray than the front legs easy to forget something like that, that you've left it I'm going to absorb a little bit of that paint up I just pulled up a little bit of that paint with my thirsty brush now I'm going to switch to my number six brush and just I'm going to get this face a little bit darker it needs a little bit more color and that's the thing with watercolor you don't have to go you don't have to go dark in your first layer and sometimes you can't. Sometimes it's too hard to get a good dark in your first layer. You can go for two or three layers to build up your color. And you can get some good richness in that way. Especially if you have a slightly different color underneath and then all the colors will show through. So I'm just going to go under that chin with a little bit more gray brown under there where it's a little bit darker. a little bit more paint. I might even want to put a little bit more shadow on the outer sides of the legs. And you can see how light the body looks now that we're getting all of the dark, the dark face turn everything in. I just want to ease that nose down there. I, I think I will when that's dry. Get some of that edge back again to the nose when that's dried. The body's now looking very light now that I have all of those darks in. So this is when I go back with just a little bit more dark in places to, to darken up some of those shadows.
just a little bit here and there and you can't you can't judge well you could if you were better than I am but I can't judge until I get all of the darks in how much more I need to put in in the sh in the shading and the shadows and I think that's a general thing that you 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 need to go back and think about that after you put in all of those shadows and and the darks and then go back and judge what you need now I'm going to let you catch up a little bit I don't know how you're doing I'm just going to check on my grandson I have to go check on him and see how he's doing then I'll be back in a minute oh you keep working and I'll check in on you in a couple of minutes and before we before we finish up I'll just explain the snow splattering and anything else that you could put on it. You don't have to put, don't have to put stuff on there. And um, you know, if if you just like it like this, you don't have to put the sparkles. You don't have to put the snow. They're all optional things that you might like to do on your card. Totally up to you. But I want. I'm just going to use the hair dryer on his face because I just want to lift a little bit of the edge of the face and finish off the eyes. I'm going to use the hairdryer again. Right, so I'm going to just do a little bit of work on lifting. I don't know what I did with my lifting brush. Oh, I bought a brush stand so that I wouldn't lose my brushes when I was teaching. And what I don't do is remember to use my brush stand. There we go. Right, so I'm going to try lifting that little edge of the face so that it's a little bit more distinct just here. I'm working a little faster than I would normally because I'm just cognizant of the time and I'll lift a little bit of the eyes. So don't feel, you know, we're, two hours for a class is, is kind of rushing in a little bit. And I just want to kind of show you everything. I would take a little bit more time when I'm just working on my own. And you can too. It's, a, it's an artificial thing doing a class because you you have to sort of be kept to a time limit. And, and I don't always do that when I'm painting. I might do a little bit and then go away and do something else and let it dry and then come back later and have a look at it. So I'm rushing just a little bit, which means that I'm not leaving enough drying time because even with a hairdryer, it doesn't dry thoroughly all the way through. So I'm, I'm lifting a little bit with my lifting brush lifting out the eyes a little bit. And even with the hairdryer, it's still quite damp. I probably have to leave it a couple of hours to really dry thoroughly. It's also not that dark around the body of the sheep. 
And some of them do turn out quite dark and some of them don't. So that, that's another thing that, the thing is if I go around it again, I'm gonna lose a lot of my, my snow look. But I could, I also kind of, but I'm, I'm in two minds. Like I don't know whether to, to go around it again and get a little bit of dark along this edge and risk the snow or leave it. You can see I'm wetting it up. So I've decided I'm going to try and get, I'm going to try and get a dark edge around the sheep here. Now the sheep's dry, so that's going to make it easier than when it was wet. And I'm going to sacrifice some of that salty snow because I want it a little bit darker around here. And it always helps you if I show you some ways to fix things. And again, that's that looks terrible like that. You can't leave it like that. It's that, again the case of putting on the paint and then taking your clean, slightly wet brush and manipulating the edge of the paint. We, I'm really wiggling my brush around. Now I will lose a lot of that, that snow, but that's okay because I've got rather a lot. And then I can do something called charging. Charging is when you've got a wet area like I have here, and I've blended that out a little bit. I'll take some burnt sienna and the blue. I should bring that over so you can see what I'm doing. Sorry about that. I've got a little bit of burnt sienna in the blue because I'm thinking I'd like a little bit more definition here at the top of the white sheep. I don't want to go near the ear. I want to have a little bit of white snow on the ear. And I won't worry about the snow too much. I'll put some more in with some white paint. Now that looks horrible. You can't leave it like that. Again, I washed out my brush, dabbed it on my sponge, and I'm going to just manipulate that around a little bit. And then I'm gonna do something called charging. Charging is when you get some darker paint, not as wet, it can't be very wet. If it's too wet, you'll just get big, big puddles. And you have to have a wet surface to charge it into. So you can get some darker paint that's not too wet. And I'm going to put it by that light edge that I want to accentuate. And I'm just going to let it flood out into that wet area that I've created. Now beware, if you do try this, if you think, oh, well, the edge of my sheep's not really uh, light enough. Um, uh, it doesn't stand out because that's not dark enough. Be aware that you're going to lose your your salt flakes doing this. You can't do them a second time. It's not going to work. I'm I'm just fiddling with mine because I I really really would like it a little bit darker around the sheep because it's going to make the sheep stand out lighter. I'm still going to leave that salt there, even under the sheep. I think I still think. Under here, I might want it a little bit darker. This is just, this now is just pure ultramarine blue. All by itself with, of course, water added, wet brush. Blend that in. And add a little bit of found edge. This is this is finding these edges of the sheep. Having the dark there will find them. Then you can lose them again here in the white snow. That's lovely. It's a lovely technique, lost and found. And the wet, the wet brush just smooths, smooths that paint in to make soft snow. And you don't want to do too much because if I do too much, I'm going to lose all the white snow. That's, that was just enough to find the edges of the sheep. 
sometimes the the background wash will work out just perfectly and you don't need to do that and sometimes i just i just want to to get a little bit more dark behind the sheep so let's look at some of the final steps i'm going to use this one now i would make sure before i did this i would make sure that all these sheep were finished before I did the splattering the snow. And you don't have to do the splattering the snow. It's not required. It's just something I like to do on my Christmas cards. It kind of finishes them off and puts them in a in a snowstorm. So I like to use the Dr. PH Martin's uh, bleed proof white. You don't have to use that. You can use white gouache, white watercolor paint, or um, now there's this nice flat uh, golden acrylic paint you can use that too my personal preference is the dr ph martin's bleed proof white and you need to mix it with water for this to work and i need just to switch to my clean water because i'm working with white i want my water to be perfectly clean so i've just gone and grabbed really really clean water no paint in it and I'm going to wet, I, I keep it in this dish because you can wet it up over and over again. It doesn't matter if it's dried. And I'm going to add a little bit more to this here. This, this, this stuff lasts for years. You use so little of it and you mix it with water. And I'm getting it nice and creamy. That's like, like a nice cream in here. You can see on the brush, nice and opaque. Now you can use all kinds of brushes for this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get a piece of I'm get a piece of brown paper so you can see what I'm going to do on the brown paper with different brushes. Now this is my big number 10 brush. So if I get my hand and I tap this brush on my hand, I get a whole bunch of splatter. Now this is quite a big brush. So you might want to use something that's a bit smaller. Now I don't use fan brushes for anything except splattering I don't like them but they're lovely for splattering so I'm going to get both sides of this fan brush nice little one covered in this white and I'm going to do the same thing I'm going to tap I get just as um, a finer particle and I suggest you do this on a piece of scrap paper first or, or something and I suggest you do it on something you can actually see I've done this on some brown card here so I can actually see what the spat is going to look like and then when I'm confident it's just going to look like small snowflakes then I can I've got I've got my finger probably about three inches from the paper and I'm I always try and keep it in a diagonal kind of a pattern so it's not not going to um, look too Odd, and I'm just going to get some snow everywhere. Now, like I said, you don't have to do this. It's just something I love to do on my Christmas cards. And what I would do is I would have finished these off before I did that. The other thing you can do with your uh, PH Martins white, if you want to, if, if you've lost some snow drifts or you want clumps of snow on these branches, you can just get your paintbrush and you can add some clumps of snow on these branches or you can add some snow drifts if you need some. Or if you've lost a white on your sheep, you can do that if you, if you need to have some extra white. Now, the thing that you can do before you do all that, I'm going in the wrong order. Please be aware I'm going in the wrong order here to get through everything that I would do is I've got my tiny, tiny brush, or you can use a fine um, fine pen, like a Micron, I'd use a 03 actually. Um, I'd use a Micron 03 or a fine brush. And you can use that to do those trees in the background if you wanted some trees in the background. I'm just gonna use this very fine brush and some of the panes gray and brown and just put some very, very fine branches in the background. Now the, the photo has some quite distinct trees, but I don't like that look. I think it just needs to be a little bit more subtle. 
and sometimes you can just smush out with your fingertip. Most of the time I don't like to get my fingers on the paper because you put oil everywhere, but this is the final stage and I'm not gonna be doing much more painting so I can smush those in with my fingertip if I want to. It's just such a useful tool, very handy. And, and at this point, you might want to put in more branches. You might feel, oh, I just want a bit more in the foreground or no branches at all, because that's where you're going to put your greeting. It's your painting, so you do what you want to do with it. Put the lid on my white paint before I have a little spill. Put over here. And I... I I guess one of my, one of my little favorites is this little stickles um, sparkly glue stuff. And shake it down to the. It's got a very fine uh, spout on it, and very fine glitter in it. So it, it's it's nice and subtle. If you wanted to have a little bit of a little bit of glitter in the foreground on your cards. This one's called Crystal, so it just gives you a, a nice crystal sparkle, stickles. And the other thing is the Jelly Roll pen. If it's got this little star on the side that sort of sparkles, it's just a, a clear sparkle pen. And let's do that again on the on here. So you can, I don't know if you, yeah, you can just see it. It's very, very subtle. And they're so inexpensive. They're less than $3, I think. Well, they've probably gone up lately. They're around $3. This gives a very subtle... They last a long time to have had these quite a few years. They don't dry up. Uh, they, they make a nice line. And this, this one's lovely too. This is a jelly roll, sort of a, a sparkly, um, nice red, which is lovely for Christmas cards too. Nice and shiny. Right, let's go back to Mr. Sheepman. And this one is almost finished. He just really, she really needs her eyes. And I would do that, I think, with a micron pen usually. And I'd wait till it was perfectly dry because it takes it takes an hour or so to really dry up nicely. But I'm gonna put I'm gonna put it in now. The the horizontal line. Just just to give her a bit more of a face. And then I would also give her some snow. I'll get my spattery brush. And good idea if you have any computers, iPads, phones nearby, it's really good to cover them up because mine get covered in white splatter all over the place. There we go. And like I said, if you've lost some of the white on your sheep, there's no harm in using a little bit of that white paint to to get it back if you need to if you've lost if you've lost any snow if you want to have a bit more white snow there's nothing wrong with using your white paint to get a little bit of that back and and of course a nice thing is when you're finished if you've been very careful putting your tape on making sure you get it nice and straight and fully covering your border. What you've got is a nice edge to your card. So um, some of the people on Wednesday in the live class, they really liked the, the black background for their sheep. But you have, you know, you do you. You could do navy blue, it's very nice. And then because it's Christmas, I, because it's Christmas, I'm going this year mostly with the um, sparkly, sparkly, it's not sparkly, it's more just kind of shiny red. I kind of like that look. I'll be sticking all my, my Merry Christmases on. And calligraphers, don't judge me. When you do 50 cards and you, you're worried about your shaky calligraphy, you just cut them out and stick them on because it's safer. 
and they look rather nice because they're in shiny paper too. So I would just like to give you some ideas for making your Christmas cards if you want to do that. I have several here that I've already made. Now I have a little machine that cuts out uh, card and paper and I've cut out these Merry Christmases to put on some of mine but you can also write it by hand or stamp it or put nothing on. The cards that I use come in a pack of 50 from Michaels. They have envelopes. They fold up so that they're five inches by six and a half inches, which is perfect for four and a half inch by six inch watercolor paper. I'll put this away because they're crackly, make a lot of noise. Uh, the cards come flat, so you have to uh, fold them yourself, but they have a fold in the center. And I have a, a little tool I got from the Dollar Tree and they're called a bone folder because they used to be made from bone but of course this is a dollar so it was made it's made of plastic and it's lovely it's just fine for folding it gives you a nice fold and I really like to have I like to have um, a color before I put the watercolor paper on especially if it's on a Christmas card and this year I've chosen to have this nice shiny red each year I have maybe a different color so I want to just go through the steps that I do to glue these down or put them on the, the cards. The first thing I'm going to do is instead of putting the cutout words on this one, I'm going to show you how you could um, easily just buy a stamp of some kind. And a, this is just a tiny, tiny ink pad in dark red. It's waterproof. These ones, these Ranger Archival ones are waterproof. So I tend to get those then I can use them with my watercolors and paint over them if I want to. It just makes it easy. So I'm just stamping on some ink. I want to get make sure it's well inked up. Get it up the right way, get it straight. And then I'm going to stamp on this one. Merry Christmas. Now we go to a bit of pressure. Now watercolor paper has texture and it's often quite difficult to get things to stamp well. That's, that's okay. And if it if it hasn't stamped really well, if you have one of those jelly roll pens, excuse me, I'm just going to grab one. You've already got your stamping here. And if you wanted to go over it with a shiny pen or a jelly roll pen, you can go over it and just make it stand out a little bit. The jelly roll pens tend to sort of stand up away from the paper just a tiny bit, which makes them look a little three dimensional. So that's another idea for you. Now, there's several ways you can glue this down. The cheapest way is I buy this double-sided tape from the Dollar Tree again. It's a, it's a dollar. I think they've gone up to a dollar twenty-five now, inflation. But I like it because there's not much waste with this. There's no sort of plastic packaging or anything. It's just tape and easy to use. I'll show you how to use that in a minute. And I use that most of the time. But some other glues that I really like. Uh, very expensive actually, yes, paste, but it's acid free. Uh, it's used by artists and, and book vendors and all kinds of people. And it's really, really good glue. So if you want a really good bond, um, and it's, a, it's a huge tub of it. This is a pint. And it, my daughter's had some for, I don't know, 15 years. It lasts a long, long time. It doesn't dry out or anything. It's, it's, it's lovely. And the other one I have is Nuvo glue. And what I like about the Nuvo glue is it has a very fine nozzle. So if I want to glue those little words on, I can get nice fine uh, glue on small things. So let's use my two favorite methods anyway. If you're gluing watercolor paper to something, it's quite strong. So you often want to use something like this Yes glue. I'm gonna use the wrong tool here. I don't want to use my bone folder to put my glue on. I want to use, uh, I did have a plastic. Anyway, I want to use a, a palette knife. Here it is, I've got a plastic one, that's better. So I have a plastic palette knife and it's like spreading butter. You take a little bit of the glue and you spread it very thinly. The lovely thing is it, it, it doesn't require much. That's why it lasts you so long and you spread it thinly 
on your watercolour paper. And this is going to give you a strong bond if that's what you want. And acid free, so it's not going to make the back of your paper yellow or brown. It's not going to leach through to your, your colours on the front. It's not going to dry up and crack with age like so many other glues will. They will, they will ruin your paintings. But, it, you know, if it's a card, most people chuck their cards out after a little while. They might not chuck out a lovely handmade one from you, but it's still not going in the National Gallery, I don't think. Right, so I, I put this paper down so that I didn't get glue all over my table. So that's well glued up. I used hardly any from that tub. And the nice thing about this glue too is it's repositionable. So you can you have a little bit of time to wiggle stuff around if you want to uh, undo what you just glued and put it a bit straighter. I just like a little bit of, so you can kind of wiggle it around a bit, a little bit of the edge showing. And I just want to burnish that down. Now most of the time when I'm card making, I use the double-sided tape. It's just cheaper and quicker. And they're just cards. But I just want to show you how you can use a better product if you want to. Put the lid on my Yes Glue, put that away. Now I think that tub cost me about $45. It is not cheap stuff, but it is good stuff. And my daughter assured me it lasts me probably till I die. So. I'll be fine. I don't think she said it like that. I think that was my interpretation. Right, now double-sided tape. I'm going to use that to put this card to the card. So I'm going to grab the end here. I'm going to tape it down along the edge. Now if you're really nice and good and neat, you can snip it off with your scissors. I tend to be a bit more... Well, when I'm making 50 cards, I tend to put it down, put my thumb there and just rip it off because I don't have time to get the scissors out. But, you know, if you want to be neat and tidy and get your scissors out, chop it off. Now, each piece of this tape has got a little wax backing on it. So what I want to do is make sure I use my bone folder again and burnish that tape down so it's really stuck well to the, the card and get this the right way up now get your card the right way up i can't tell you how many people glue their their sheep on and then find that their card opens backwards make sure your card is up the right way and lay it down in front of you and then put this down where you know you're going to put it let's zoom in a little bit oh sorry it zoomed in a crazy amount there we go Mm, it's still a bit close, isn't it? I have to do it with like that. Now, if you take all of this tape off at once and you stick this down crooked, you're done. You can't, you can't maneuver that thing at all. That's where the yes glue is better. So here's what I do. I just peel off the bottom tape, always the bottom. So I always, always know where the sticky side is. And I don't put that sticky side down. I get the other three sides lined up and straight as I can. And remembering if it's a Christmas card and I've got 50 to do, we just get as straight as we can. And as soon as I'm happy that it's fairly straight, I let that lower edge down and I burnish it with my bone folder. And then I have to get the tape peeled off the other edges. So I can just lift the edge a little bit um, it's a little tricky to get your nail in there, but you can peel it off. Now, some people halfway peel this tape off before they do that. Or you can start the tape and put it back down again. I can't deal with that halfway tape sticking out this way and that way. I can't get a nice straight edge. I prefer to just do it afterwards. And then you, you press it down and you're done. Your card is made, it'll stand up. I have a nifty little thing I ordered off the internet from Rubber Stamp Champ. I think it was like $6. It has my little name and card stamp on there. I've had it for a long time and it's not run out of ink yet. So I just brand my 
opening there and in the middle I have a number of stamps that say Merry Christmas, Seasons Greetings, all that kind of thing and I will use a different one because I've put I put this one on the front so I'll put different ones inside and that's how you that's how you make your cards this one of course stands up the other way and I've put blue on this background they look nice with black as well and pretty soon you, you've got quite a collection I've got a few more over there to do and uh, there you go I hope I really hope you enjoyed it and that you make some cards and I'll see you next week, you lovely painters. So how did your sheep turn out? Don't be disappointed if you had a bit of a struggle the first time. Sometimes you need to just practice stuff again and learn from your mistakes. I do still have to do them two or three times, sometimes learn from my mistakes. And sometimes I make mistakes on the third one I didn't make on the first one. So um, it's our first lesson back. Don't be discouraged and I hope you got something that looked like a sheep on there. I know some people said they got something that looked like a collie dog and maybe some other farm animal, doesn't matter. Put some glitter on them, sprinkle some snow on them and send them to your friends. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you again next week. Bye for now.